Whereas it appears that a state of war exists between Austria, Prussia, Sardinia, Great Britain, and the United Netherlands of the one part, and France on the other, and the duty and interests of the United States require that they should with sincerity and good faith adopt and pursue a conduct friendly and impartial toward the belligerent powers. I have therefore thought fit by these presents to declare the disposition of the United States to observe the conduct aforesaid toward those powers respectively, and to exhort and warn the citizens of the United States carefully to avoid all acts and proceedings whatsoever which may in any manner tend to contravene such disposition. Though the one word by which this proclamation would become famous is not present in the text, all who read it immediately realized what it meant. The United States, despite its Treaty of Alliance with France of 1778, would not be joining the side of France in its struggles against the majority of Europe and would instead remain neutral. Little could anyone have imagined that this proclamation would become a cornerstone of American foreign policy for the next century and change, or the effect that the public debate in the lead-up to and aftermath of this proclamation would have on the political landscape of the United States. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Now, I do have to admit that we are coming in this episode to one of my favorite, somewhat infamous characters in the early Republic. Honestly, I can't even explain why he fascinates me so. Perhaps it is his boldness and daring to challenge even Washington. Perhaps it's just that this point in the American political story is so divergent from anything seen before or since. Perhaps it's the fact that I can never resist an underdog. Without regard, Edmund Charles Genet is just a fascinating figure for me, and I revel in the opportunity to be able to share his story with you now. However, I must resist for a moment, as there's some stuff that I have to get you caught up on before we get to Citizen Genet. I handed a couple of episodes back that heads would roll in France, and indeed, they did. Louis XVI, or Louis Capet, as he would come to be called by the revolutionaries, was not long for this world, despite Louis' capitulation on the issue of the émigrés in December 1791. The following year would find the king dismissing his ministry on March 10th due to agitations from the National Assembly, and on April 20th announcing that war had been declared against the king of Hungary and Bohemia, Francis II, nominally also the head of Austria, though he had not yet been elected Holy Roman Emperor following the death of the previous emperor on March 1st. It was claimed that this would be, quote, a defensive war of a free people against an aggressive king. There would be no conquest, and French force would never be used against the liberty of any people. In reality, this was a war against the emigres as much as it was against the Austrians, and a warning for the foreigners as well as the expatriate French nobles to not interfere in the revolution. In the first battle, though, an invasion of Austrian-held Belgium on April 28th, not only were the French troops routed, but they turned on their general and killed him as they suspected him of treason. Things would only get worse from there, and with problems heaped upon problems with the revolt in Saint-Domingue, economic shortages, and the lagging war effort, it's not surprising that scapegoats were sought out. Indeed, even before the French war effort began, one of the first leaders of the early days of the revolution run out of office was Washington's protege, the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette had hitherto added legitimacy to the French Revolution in both the eyes of his American friends and French compatriots, but in his role as head of the National Guard, he attempted to convince the Guard to support the king, and thus was seen by radicals in the revolutionary government as being too much of a monarchist and not a true friend of the revolution. Thus, they sought his removal beginning in July 1791, after an incident in which he rode in with the National Guard to restore order when a crowd of around 10,000 radicals hung two accused spies at the Champ de Mars. After being countered with gunshots and thrown stones, the Guard opened fire and killed somewhere between a dozen and 50 crowd members. This was dubbed the Champ de Mars Massacre, and Lafayette was accused of being responsible for the murder of civilians. Lafayette would resign from his post in October, but would be recalled to service as commander of an army in December. However, after the disastrous first battle in April 1792, Lafayette began calling for peace and started attempting to counter the radical influence in the French government, even writing an open letter to the National Assembly on June 16th calling for the fall of the ministry that had gotten the country into this war. 
That summer would prove to be a decisive one for the King and Lafayette. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. On July 25, 1792, the leader of the Allied Army, the Duke of Brunswick, issued what would come to be known as the Brunswick Manifesto, warning the French populace that if any harm came to King Louis, then he would have no qualms about responding in kind to the civilian population and destroying Paris itself. What was meant to intimidate only infuriated. In the eyes of the radicals, this was incontrovertible proof that the king and queen were in league with the Austrians and Prussians. There was only one thing to be done. On August 10th, a mob crowded into the Tuileries Palace and took King Louis and Queen Marie Antoinette into custody. The National Assembly soon acted to abolish the monarchy, and Louis XVI of the Royal House of Bourbon would become citizen Louis Capet on September 21st. General Lafayette would quickly discover, along with other French nobles, that he was no safer than the deposed monarchs. On August 14th, a warrant was issued for Lafayette's arrest. Rather than wait for the authorities to come, Lafayette took off towards the Austrian Netherlands. His aim was to ultimately secure passage to the United States, but he fell far short of that goal and ended up in Austrian custody. He would ultimately remain in foreign custody for the remainder of Washington's tenure in office. We shall return to Lafayette in a later episode, but for now, we must walk the king down his final steps. The question soon became what to do with the deposed king. While radicals called for his immediate execution, the ruling Girondins ultimately made arrangements for Louis to be tried by the National Convention. The votes were cast in mid-January, and Louis was sentenced to execution. Even his own cousin, the former Duc d'Orléans, voted for Louis' execution. On January 21, 1793, Louis was beheaded by guillotine. The news of Louis' demise arrived in Philadelphia shortly after Washington's second inauguration, on March 17. This development would force Washington to begin to think about whether he would recognize this new republic and whether he would view this as a continuation of the previous government, thus retaining our prior alliance and obligations to France, or if it was to be viewed as a new nation in which all would be up to question. Certainly, the Secretary of State was all in favor of recognition of the French Republic and of seeing it as the next phase of the same nation. As he argued in a letter to the U.S. Minister to France, Governor Morris, quote, We surely cannot deny to any nation that right whereon our own government is founded, that every nation may govern itself according to whatever form it pleases. The will of the nation is the only thing essential to be regarded. The Cabinet, including Hamilton, all agreed that the U.S. should pay more than was currently due on an installment of the debt from the Revolutionary War to the French Republic in order for that government to be able to provide relief to its people who were suffering from food shortages. It should be noted, however, that Hamilton did want to reduce the amount sent, but he was ultimately overruled. This work done and Congress having adjourned, Washington began the trip back to Mount Vernon, where he arrived on April 2nd. His deputies will remain in Philadelphia to oversee the government and let him know if there was cause for him to return to the capital early. He would be back on the road before the month was out. The primary reason for Washington's early return was a rumor that would ultimately be substantiated that, on February 1st, France had declared war on both the longtime American ally, the Netherlands, and the one-time enemy of the United States, Great Britain. Washington knew that, with war between Britain and France, otherwise known as the nation's two largest trading partners, there would be pressure put on the United States to take sides. Writing to Jefferson on April 12th of his planned return to Philadelphia, though, he made clear what his intended policy would be. Quote, War having actually commenced between France and Great Britain, it behooves the government of this country to use every means in its power to prevent the citizens thereof from embroiling us with either of those powers by endeavoring to maintain a strict neutrality. Why was George Washington, the military hero of the American Revolution, seeking to not get embroiled in the fight? Well, a couple of reasons. First, 
From Washington's life as a whole, one can see that he was a firm believer that discretion is the better part of valor. One should try the way of peace and of pacifying all parties first before seeking battle. When battle had to be joined, though, one should make sure that it was battle that one could win. And he knew that the United States would not win in this battle. St. Clair's defeat was only a little over a year past, and thus still fresh in the minds of those in the government. Whatever military force the United States had at the time was no match for taking on European armies, and indeed was deemed more critical to securing the Old Northwest for settlement and development. Further, and take this with a grain of salt if you'd like, but one has to wonder if Washington felt that the political climate of the United States was such that it could not survive a war in which the choice was between Great Britain or France. As we've discussed previously, it was seen at home and abroad that the factions that were forming were more closely aligned with one nation or the other. What would become the Federalist Party saw greater value to our relationship with Great Britain, while Jefferson, and by extension his supporters, sought a greater alliance with France. It is not coincidental that the first Democratic Republican Society, which was a new political club described by historian Ron Chernow as, quote, intended by its organizers to evoke the Sons of Liberty chapters from the Revolution, while apprehensive Federalists found them eerily reminiscent of the French Jacobin clubs, was established in Philadelphia in April 1793 following the news of the execution of Louis and the French declaration of war against Great Britain started filtering into the city. Washington could not logistically choose between Great Britain and France, even if he wanted to, without having Edmund Randolph's predictions the year prior of civil war coming into play. No, the only course that the nation could pursue for the good of national security and prosperity was neutrality. But then along came Genet. Now, yes, I realize this is the second episode in a row where a Frenchman has played a prominent role in our narrative, but it is the nature of the times. When they weren't designing capital cities, the French were trying to pull us into an international conflict. So who is this Edmund Charles Genet? Like L'Enfant, he grew up at Versailles with two of his four sisters serving as ladies-in-waiting to Queen Marie Antoinette. By the age of 15, he had mastered six languages and became a career diplomat who was known not only to the nobility, but also famous inventors such as James Watt and Joseph Priestley, as well as America's own Benjamin Franklin. He had served in diplomatic posts in Berlin, Vienna, and England before he headed to the court of Catherine the Great in Russia in 1791. Though he was described as a, quote, monarchist by temperament, the Genet who went to Catherine's court was becoming increasingly vocal about his support for the French Revolution. Though he was initially well received, by the tail end of 1792, Catherine had had her fill of the diplomat and of the revolution in general. On top of mocking Genet and other French officials in court, she expelled Genet from the country and ultimately broke off relations with the French government. As his faction of the revolutionary government, the Girondins, were in power, Genet would find himself heading not back to France after his expulsion from Russia, but rather across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. The Provincial Executive Council issued orders on December 30, 1792, to recall the current French minister, Jean-Baptiste Tourneau, who had been appointed by the previous monarch-led government, and to replace him with Genet, who would be the first minister sent to the U.S. by the French Republic. The U.S. minister to France, Governor Morris, dined with Genet at the end of December and reported back to Washington that, quote, he has, I think, more of genius than of ability, and you will see in him at the first blush the manner and look of an upstart. Due to the weather, Genet would not set sail until February 20th aboard the French frigate Embuscade and would arrive on U.S. soil at Charleston, South Carolina on April 8th. Genet's arrival was heralded by the city, and he made his round among the city's upper echelons, be they pro-administration or anti-administration. From there, he made his way towards Philadelphia, being feted along the way. Hamilton's close associate, Representative William Lawton Smith of South Carolina, wrote Hamilton on April 24th that, quote, A gentleman arrived from Camden, South Carolina this morning, tells me that they mean to compliment him, Genet, with a public dinner, a foolish thing entre nous, translated between us. The pro-administration leaders, who weren't smitten by the new French minister, found that they had to tread carefully due to his initial popularity. They had to watch 
and wait. The administration, having received word of Genet's coming prior to Washington's departure from Mount Vernon, had already decided that Washington would receive him, though Washington asserted that the reception should not display, quote, too much warmth and cordiality, a consolation to Hamilton's views on the matter. Upon Washington's unplanned early return to Philadelphia, he immediately consulted with his cabinet and assigned Attorney General Edmund Randolph the task of drafting up the Neutrality Proclamation. You remember how I said in the intro that the word neutrality was not used in the proclamation? It seems that might have been intentional in order to secure Jefferson's support for the document. When it was presented to the cabinet on April 22nd, it was approved unanimously without debate. What caused the big hubbub in the cabinet, though, were other questions that Washington put to his cabinet as to whether Genet should be received, quote, absolutely or with qualification, and whether the treaties previously negotiated with France were still in effect. Basically, all of these boiled down to one big question. Was the current government of France legitimate? Even Washington, in his series of questions, mentions the possibility of a, quote, future regent of France as opposed to the revolutionary French government. As the Americans were well aware, the success of the French Republic was not guaranteed. The United States had experienced a hard enough time breaking away from a system of monarchy based an ocean away on another continent. While the optimism had been nearly unanimous as the first news of the revolution reached the U.S. back in 1789, the current state of things had some Americans questioning whether this revolution could succeed. One American, Thomas Rhett Smith, had written as early as the end of 1790 that, quote, there is very little resemblance between our revolution and that of the French, either in their effects or in the motives and principles. We did not say, as the French did, whatever is, is not right, and set about leveling all that had been raised. The French made an indiscriminate destruction of everything, good or evil. Little did they know what terrors lay ahead. However, there were other Americans who were more optimistic than ever before about the French Revolution, and Genet's arrival would only strengthen their revolutionary fervor. As far north as Boston, pro-French sentiment grew the closer Genet got to Philadelphia. A French frigate, La Concorde, arrived in Boston around the time that the Genet fever was sweeping the nation, and the crew aboard started, quote, denouncing leading Boston citizens as aristocrats. And the people seemed receptive to such talk something that pro-administration leaders watched very carefully. As Genet drew closer, the Washington administration planned for his arrival. Washington had requested written opinions from his cabinet members about the questions remaining about the state of U.S.-French relations. Naturally, Jefferson responded that of course the previous treaties were still valid, and we should recognize Genet and the new government without question, while Hamilton, as expected, responded that no, the treaties were null and void and should be suspended until a stable French government was established. Secretary of War Henry Knox, rather than developing a written opinion of his own, just said ditto to Hamilton's and signed his name to Hamilton's opinion. The big question remaining was how Attorney General Edmund Randolph was going to respond. However, before he could, Hamilton developed a plan for enforcing the Neutrality Proclamation and gave it to Washington for his review. Surprise, surprise, Hamilton wanted to route all enforcement activities through the Treasury Department. Custom House officials would report violations through the chain of command up to Hamilton, who would then work with Randolph, quote, to secure indictments against the individual or individuals involved. Washington refused to make a decision before he heard Randolph's opinion on the remaining questions and consulted with him, though. So on May 3rd, Washington sent him a reminder that he was still waiting for his report. I'm sure he didn't use the word slacker in his turn-in-your-paper note to Randolph, though I wouldn't be surprised if the caustic side of Washington was thinking something along those lines, especially as the situation was quickly escalating to force a decision. The day before, a French frigate, the Embuscade, that ship that dropped Genet off in Charleston, had sailed into Philadelphia Harbor with two captured British ships in tow. Now, this was allowable under Article 17 of the Treaty of Amity and Commerce that had been signed in 1778 on the same day as the Treaty of Alliance. But again, the administration was torn on whether or not those treaties were still valid. The really tricky part of this whole affair was that one of the French vessels, the Grange, had been taken by the French within U.S. territorial waters. This was a clear challenge to American neutrality. 
Naturally, the British minister to the U.S., George Hammond, filed a formal complaint the same day with evidence that the Grange had been seized in U.S. waters, which Jefferson then brought to Washington on the 3rd. They managed to stall for time by asserting that they needed to get a response from French Minister Tournon, but they did assure Hammond that they did not take the situation lightly, as it was not just a threat to neutrality, but even more importantly, a threat to American sovereignty. On May 6th, Washington had his answer from Randolph. Now, Randolph's opinion was basically the same as Jefferson's, but the difference was in the style. By this point, Jefferson and Hamilton, when making arguments within the cabinet, were not so much presenting evidence for consideration by Washington, but rather arguing against one another. Randolph's opinion, though, is noted for, quote, its mild, non-belligerent language and presented, quote, a thoroughly dispassionate cabinet opinion. Randolph argued, citing Swiss legal expert Emir de Vatel, that, quote, treaties were concluded between nations, not individuals, and therefore not in themselves affected by a change in the government of one of the signatories. And thus, Genet should be received without any reservations. Randolph did admit, quote, that the U.S. should, if possible, embark her happiness upon an association with no power on earth. But since such an independency is impracticable, France is the nation to which our affections tend, and from which we have the greatest expectations. Though not going into the details, he did admit that, quote, the president possesses the different views so amply, a sign that within the cabinet, they were increasingly seeing the veneer of nonpartisanship that Washington had sought to develop for his image drop. But Randolph did not approach it from an antagonistic point of view. Rather, he maintained his clinical approach in his opinion. However, he did add a note on how he felt the situation related to American politics and what problems it may pose for the administration. Randolph wrote, quote, I own without reserve that I contemplate a danger of magnitude hovering over the U.S. from the ardor of some to transplanted French politics as fresh fuel for our own parties. The very instant it shall be known that this government has, without the most palpable grounds, betrayed even a distinct inclination to sever us from France, no argument nor influence can oppose itself with success to this new hotbed of dissension. Basically, in this, Randolph was saying that once the Jeffersonians learned that Hamilton had urged to sever ties with the French Republic, but still retain those with Britain, there would be political rancor like none of them had ever seen before. In this, Randolph would prove quite prescient. For now, though, it gave Washington an answer he could live with. Genet would be received without reservations. However, they would have to determine a workable plan for how to enforce neutrality. Washington and Randolph reviewed Hamilton's plan, and the two came up with an alternative. Instead of using customs officials to report issues, Randolph would send instructions to district attorneys for them to contact the customs officials to collect, quote, information of all infractions to neutrality that may come within their purview at the different ports. This made the Attorney General, rather than the Secretary of the Treasury, the conduit between the actors on the ground and the administration. In this, one can see Washington still attempting to balance the competing factions within his cabinet. Though Randolph was known to lean more towards Jefferson's position, Hamilton wouldn't object too much to the plan, and it would appease Jefferson's concerns. How long this balance could last, though, was anyone's guess. The question still remained, though, as to what should be done about the captured British ship, the Grange. British Minister Hammond sent a second demand for the Grange's release on May 8th, and Washington had Jefferson turn over all evidence on the case to Randolph for an opinion. Randolph quickly reached the conclusion that the Grange had, in fact, been in U.S. waters when the French captured it, which violated the neutrality proclamation that he had drafted. Thus, he sent his opinion on May 14th that the ship should be returned to the British, the crew released, and restitution made for any damage incurred. The cabinet agreed, and Jefferson was directed to draft a letter to Hammond to that effect. This would not end the Washington administration's headaches, though. Not by a long shot. More news would come in from Charleston about French actions against the British. And then, on May 16th, the real fun would begin, 
as Edmund Charles Genet arrived in Philadelphia. This all must, unfortunately, wait until next time in an episode that I'd like to call Don't Mess with Washington, The Fall of Edmund Charles Genet. Before we part ways, I did want to wish hearty congratulations to Melissa, who is the winner of our drawing for the $15 gift card to Pals Books. Here's hoping that it brings you much joy as you continue your reading journey. Thank you so much to all who took the time to complete the survey and provide feedback. It will be very beneficial as we move forward with year two of my podcasting adventure. Also, as always, a special thanks to the podcast audio editor, Andrew Foncook. As we navigate the turbulent waters of the second Washington term, I know that we'll be in safe hands in terms of good audio with him in charge of that aspect of production. If you, like me, could use Andrew's able audio editing expertise on your podcast or audio project, send him an email at andrew at fonkuk, that's P-F-A-N-N-K-U-C-H-E dot com. As for me, if you have any questions, comments, or just want to say hi, there are many ways to get in touch with me. I'm available via email at presidenciespodcast, all one word, at gmail.com, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash presidencies, or on Twitter at presidencies89. Source information for this episode, which, as usual, is a mix of primary and secondary sources, can be found on the blog at presidencies.blueberry, that's B-L-U-B. R-R-Y dot com. I think that about wraps it up. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And take care, dear friends. Until next time. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it, because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts.